So, um, our final four speakers, as you well know, um, are landmark characters in the history of AWF because they were each installed with AWF funding to provide uh, strong and purposeful animal welfare and ethics education in the UK vet schools. Um, just by m way of memory, again, we've already um, mentioned um, uh, our, our colleague, the late Carl Padgett, Padge, but just to add to Julian's comments, uh, he was chair of trustees when I was an AWF trustee, and he was a real champion of, of what we're about to hear, and he was delighted that they were installed, and then delighted that the universities went on to secure funding beyond the AWF pump priming funding. So I know that he'll be uh, delighted, to, to use that word again, uh, to, to, to hear from them today, and for us all to hear from them today, and their legacy. So first up, please, uh, we have the very well-known Donald Broom, who's Emeritus Professor of Animal Welfare at the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Donald. Thank you very much, Sean. It's, uh, it's great to, that we have this session. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, we, we, are, we are going to consider what has happened over 40 years. And uh, it's sort of surprising. A lot of, a lot of people here weren't here 40 years ago, were they? No. So, what, what, what was it like 40 years ago and what has changed? And the answer to this is there have been some, I think, some very substantial improvements and I think that the Animal Welfare Foundation has been one of the major drivers of these changes. Uh, but there are also things which have, haven't uh, reached the ideal situation yet, shall we say. So, in, in the early 1980s, at the time when uh, people were starting to think about having an Animal Welfare Foundation, uh, animal welfare wasn't considered to be a scientific subject at all, uh, and uh, most people confused welfare with rights, and for some people that hasn't changed, but I think a lot of people do now understand that, that animal welfare is a scientific subject. Um, there, in many countries around the world, there wasn't any legislation at all uh, in relation to animal protection. Of course, there was legislation in the, in the UK and in, in most European countries had, had some, but we did have a directive in the EU uh, from 1978 about veterinary education, and it didn't refer directly to welfare, it referred to protection and behaviour, and it said that a veterinary, a veterinary surgeon ought to know something about protection and behaviour, and it had to be incorporated in uh, the veterinary curriculum. And so that was already starting to happen, but only starting to happen. And then we have the, uh, the, the general concept of uh, humans and other animals, and, are they, and how different are they? And uh, at that time, there was hardly anybody who would have referred to humans as animals. Uh, there were people who did. Uh, and in fact, probably the ones who did most were those who were doing laboratory studies using animal models because they obviously wanted to be able to say, well, the same things are going on in non-humans and in humans. Um, but uh, in other ways, there wasn't much concern of that kind. And I think it's quite interesting to think about what people think now. Uh, there are still many people who are entirely human-focused and don't think that any other species are of value in the world. And then there are other people who think that lots of species are of value, and probably that the sentient ones uh, might be of a bit more value. But uh, uh, there, so there have been changes, but there are still, I think, uh, there's still a long way. I think in, in, in another 20 years, we'll think about this period as being a backward period, in that we were thinking about other species as being so enormously different from humans that they were of little consequence. And uh, I think that that is... So it, there's still change going on. But it was the case that most of the public thought that it was wrong to cause pain and suffering to animals which were being used by people. And that applied to companion animals, and it applied less, but still to some extent, to working animals, farm animals, laboratory animals. So the idea that suffering was something which we ought to be avoiding, and we wanted to know something about it. And this was the sort of thing that influenced Colleen MacLeod, who gave money to uh, the BVA, and she gave that money be principally because of Peter Clark. Peter Clark was, uh, was on the council of the, of, of the BVA. In fact, I think he was treasurer for a while. And she consulted him and said, I'd like to 
encourage animal welfare as a scientific subject. How could I do that? And, and he suggested that that could be done by giving money to the BVA, who would then set up a trust which would make sure that it was used for animal welfare education. And, uh, the, 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 and that was promoted uh, straight away by several... I mean, the veterinary schools thought that was a good idea. Lawson Salisbury, who was the, head of, who was the dean in Cambridge, uh, said that, Ca that Cambridge could do it and that Cambridge already had people who knew a lot about behaviour, which was thought of as being relevant, but also lots of other areas uh, to do with welfare. And so it, the, the, it was, it was the, the, the funds were given to Cambridge for a single, for a, a post, for a, a single tenure post, which, and then that was advertised and I was fortunate enough to get that job. I'm very grateful to Colleen McLeod, whom I never met because she died before uh, I, I could have done. Uh, and uh, so that, when that started, the BVA was extremely supportive and helpful to me in trying to get things going in Cambridge, as were, as were a number of other organisations. But one of the things I felt which was important was to talk to as many people in the veterinary profession as possible and to talk to everybody who was involved with animal usage organisations or animal protection organisations. And at that time, they didn't talk to one another very much. And I felt right from the beginning that uh, the producer organisations ought to be talking to the protection organisations as well as to veterinary organisations, uh, and that that was the, the way forward. And indeed, there is much better uh, contact now than they, than they used to be, and the, and the BVA promoted that. Um, also, government agencies were quite pleased to have the possibility of there being scientific information about animal welfare. So the public were generally positive about, about the uh, idea of animal welfare. Uh, I remember reading in the newspapers, as, as, as seeing a picture of myself which said, new Dr. Doolittle emerges. Um, that was, I, I was a Dr. Doolittle, and all the children were reading books about Dr. Doolittle, so uh, that was a, there was a lot of response to that. So the public response was quite was, was positive. In general, the, the, the government welcomed the possibility of there being some scientific information which might be used in legislation relating to animal usage. Uh, uh, the animal user groups, and by that I'm talking mainly about uh, farm animals, but there were also, of course, companion animal user groups but, uh, uh, and laboratory animal user groups, but the, they were not very positive about it. They thought this might interfere with their work and would be a hell of a bloody nuisance. Uh, and there were also biological scientists who didn't like the idea because it might interfere with their research. Somebody would come along and talk about welfare and they wouldn't be able to carry on with their research. So it wasn't all positive. Um, the animal protection groups were generally very supportive, but there were some who didn't welcome the idea of understanding animal welfare better because they felt that it kept the day when animals would no longer be used for anything. Uh, it, it made that day further away, and so they weren't all positive about it. Okay, so what... So what uh, uh, at the beginning, there was nobody else who had this job, and so what does a professor of animal welfare do? At the beginning, you would have say what you work on, because welfare was not thought of as anything scientific. So, you had, so it had to be defined, uh, talking about stress, needs, pain... People were talking about pain and had a reasonably good idea of it, but all these things needed to be defined and explained so that otherwise nobody knew what you were talking about. So that was, a, that was one of the first battles, and there were a lot of discussions about that. And indeed, of course, there was a need to assess animal welfare. Now, there were people doing this already. There were lots of people in, lots of people in veterinary practice who, were, who would, would, would say that everything that they were doing was promoting the welfare of animals, which it was, uh, most of what they were doing, but, uh, but, but there was that attitude. Uh, and, and there were people who were trying to, uh, to evaluate how much animals were being stressed, how much humans were being stressed. Uh, and then there were, there were interactions with individuals in the veterinary profession, uh, most of whom felt that everything to do with welfare was about health, and welfare, well, what's that? That's, 
you had to, it's quite difficult to persuade some people that it was, it was a subject, even within the profession. Um, but there were others who were very, very uh, actively in favour of the whole thing. Um, and then there were uh, people who were biologists. If, if at that time, if you wrote a, a paper and submitted it to a journal and it referred to non-humans as having feelings, even saying that they felt pain, very often the paper was immediately rejected by the editor of the journal. It wasn't even sent to referees because, obviously, only humans had, had feelings and pain, and so there wasn't any point in looking at the, 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 the paper. Um, and there were referees who would do the same thing. So it was quite difficult to get things published if you use words like that. And there was a, quite a slow change to the point, I think we're now in a point where you're allowed to say that non-humans can have feelings and emotions, um, but that was uh, absolutely unscientific and should not be said yet. Um, some people in the medical profession uh, felt that human welfare was not a measurable thing and it wasn't very important. The only thing which was important was pathology. And if it was a disease which couldn't be labelled as, as, as to do with a particular pathogen, then it wasn't very important. And, and mental health was not thought of as a very important part of human medicine at that time, in the same way that animal welfare wasn't thought of as a very important part of veterinary medicine. So everything was to do with pathogens and disease, uh, and there's been a little bit of a change in that sense. And there were people, there were people who were uh, taking decisions in the country who... Uh, who didn't like the idea that uh, if there was the idea that if it was if it was profitable it was good, if it, if the production was good the welfare must be good, and that idea was very widely espoused by people, and so uh, there's been a bit of a change in that because it, as you can see from what we've heard today. So, what what has happened since? Well, of course things have happened with lots of different people, and we're going to hear about a range of people, so I'm, but I've just put in a little bit relating to Cambridge, that um, international committees around the world have had a lot of input from people in Cambridge or trained in Cambridge. Uh, all EU laws, and we've had very many EU laws, have had some uh, input, and they still are now. There are people on the EFSA uh, panel at the moment who, are, who were trained in Cambridge. Uh, then there were people in various. There are people in various parts of the parts of the world who either spent time in the, our group in Cambridge or who attended courses in Cambridge, who have learnt something about uh, animal welfare and contributed it in, in international committees. Animal welfare is now an essential part of uh, the veterinary course in most countries in the world. So that is an enormous change. There were there, on the whole, it wasn't mentioned in, 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 uh, in, uh, well, in uh, veterinary courses or animal, animal science, animal production, biology courses. Uh, and people are now starting to think about, uh, have, have more and more started to think about welfare of, of animals other than the most obvious, as it were. So we now have people thinking about fish and thinking, thinking about wild animals. And sustainability, we've heard quite a bit about it, but the idea that... Uh, when surveys are done asking the general public what's the most important aspect of sustainability, the communist response is animal welfare is the most important part of sustainability. So animal welfare can actually change things. The science which we here have done and which lots of other people around the world have done will change things. In areas like which animals are sentient, uh, which animals feel pain, uh, the, the, that's pigs can learn what is in a mirror, that is a cognitive ability, which is important. We know more about pain, how, how, how painful is a soul ulcer. Uh, we know that non-human animals collaborate with one another, uh, in, and there have been bans on things like sow stalls, calf crates, uh, some aspects of, of uh, fish farming, uh, in that you now, have to, uh, you, you now have to stun them before killing. Uh, even broilers, there is a bit of improvement, although I would say that's still the biggest animal welfare problem. Uh, we have more sustainable cattle systems, but we have major problems, as we've heard today, with milking cows. We have changes in attitudes to whales, 
changes in attitudes to things like seals, seal skins have been banned. And so since 1986, there has been a big increase in the number of people involved in animal welfare science. So there were about 20 people in 1986 who would have said they were animal welfare scientists. Now there are three to 4,000 people who would say they're animal welfare scientists, so that's an enormous change. Um, the methodology has developed greatly. Uh, there are, when, when legal decisions are taken in many countries now, they try to get scientific information about animal welfare. Um, so we've had a group in Cambridge, uh, uh, I mean, I've been retired for 13 years, but we've had a group in Cambridge of a, around 20 or 30 people since 1986 or since just after that, and have published lots of papers and books, and so have, but the number of publications is, is enormous now in comparison with what it, what it used to be, and the number of people who've got PhDs in the area is substantial. So people from very many countries now have benefited from the progressive act of the Animal Welfare Foundation and the Animal Welfare Foundation can certainly claim a valuable influence not just in this country but around the world and we're going to hear a bit more about some of that things, courses on pain, various other posts which other speakers will tell you so things have developed, there are lots of good things have happened there's still quite a lot which needs to be done thank you Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I think we could have listened to a lot more of that, but we don't have time. Um, but it's wonderful scene setting, uh, inspirational, and leads now in, please, to uh, Jennifer Duncan, who's Senior Lecturer in Livestock Health and Welfare at the University of Liverpool. Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, hello. Well, following on from um, Donald's talk, I think it's really fair to say that the Animal Welfare Foundation has made a big impact on veterinary undergraduate education in animal welfare, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so, um, as, as Don, um, Don was saying, they've they sponsored the, the post at Cambridge, and then sort of in the early 2000s, they sponsored three lectureships um, in animal welfare at Glasgow, Bristol and Liverpool. So um, the um, Glasgow one with Dorothy McKeegan and um, there's David Main um, at Bristol and then myself at, at Liverpool. Um, so we all started around about the same time, sort of about 2005, and we worked very closely together right from the start um, to build and design our animal welfare courses. And I think one thing that was quite nice to say, we were very collaborative and we all brought something a bit different to the table. Um, Dorothy um, is, is an animal welfare scientist and um, so she um, brought significant sort of scientific rigour, shall we say, to, to, to the table. Um, David was at Bristol at the time and Bristol already had a good sort of track record in animal welfare research and animal welfare teaching that he could bring along. Um, I came very much from a sort of clinical um, background, so um, worked in sort of mixed practice, uh, farm animal practice, um, and also worked um, for DEFRA in welfare enforcement. So, so we all brought different things to, 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 to talk about and, and um, exchange ideas when we were designing the courses. And we also, you know, all the vet schools are different, so the, the, the animal welfare teaching was at various uh, different starting points. And then you've got to work within your different schools' curriculum as, as well. So it was never going to be the same curriculum across all three of us, but um, we certainly did um, you know, work, work together very well. Um, and also there were slightly different roles and expectations within our schools. So I stayed um, within the sort of clinical side of things as well as doing the animal welfare teaching, whereas uh, David and Dorothy had um, very strong um, animal welfare research expectations. So say we, we, we started off taking a, a sort of collaborative um, approach um, and we created a set of standard learning outcomes, really focusing around the principles of animal welfare legislation, ethics and science. 
Um, so, um, and they, they, we agreed that it was important to start um, the course in the first year and then revisit um, throughout the course. So we gave the veterinary students, you know, the, an introduction to animal welfare and the important principles of it right from the get-go. We also exchanged ideas on how we taught, so different teaching methods we could use, you know, ideas for speakers. We taught on each other's courses, so Dorothy developed a strong interest in veterinary ethics and um, she came down to Liverpool several times to kind of train me up a bit on that. Um, David um, is an excellent speaker and he did some really great talks to our final years on um, animal welfare and ethics in veterinary practice. And then Dorothy and David also collaborated on educational research in animal welfare as well. And we very much in those early days encouraged, supported and inspired each other. So what does a veterinary um, animal welfare course look like? Um, I think as, as Dawn alluded to earlier on, you know, and it is true, the entire veterinary course pretty much is about animal welfare. So you know, we, we learn all about the normal function, how to look after animals, you know, um, diseases, prevention, treatment. Um, so what animal welfare does, what the study of animal welfare does is, um, first of all, we, we follow the principles of animal welfare science, so we introduce that, and that's using sort of scientific methods to uh, measure animal welfare, and also, as we've seen so much today, um, using um, um, scientific methods to address animal welfare issues and try and solve them. Um, we use um, study um, animal ethics and veterinary ethics where sort of philosophical principles and reasoning are applied to um, animal welfare issues, moral issues around the treatment of animals. And then there's a lot of legislation that we have to um, include. And so veterinary professionals must have a strong foundation in the legislation. Then at Liverpool, the way I've done it is um, I've kind of done things on a sort of species basis. So I've used the expertise within the vet school to, um, to um, explore you know, issues with horse welfare, farm animal, laboratory, exotics, small animals. So I try and bring the, the different experts across the vet school um, to talk about their particular areas. And we're also very lucky that we've got a very strong forensic pathology team um, who come on board with that as well. But we really don't want it just to be a sort of didactic lecture-based course. I mean, sadly, that is part of what happens in veterinary courses. We can't you know, get away from that format just yet. Um, but we've really tried to encourage um, debate and discussion. So at Liverpool, we started off with um, small group discussion sessions um, on animal welfare topics in our clinical rotations. And now in farm animal, we have them every Friday afternoon. Um, we've also been very lucky that the trustees from AWF have come up and held evening debate sections. Um, we also, in, later on in the course, explore veterinary professional responsibilities. Um, so um, we talk about animal, how to deal with animal welfare cases in veterinary practice. Um, we work with the MSD and the Lynx group to talk about links to animal abuse. And say, wherever we can, we try and get specialists in um, so you've got that real kind of lived experience, what it's actually like on the coal face. You know, um, you know, so people from DEFRA to talk about investigating animal, farm animal welfare issues, RSPCA talk about their role. So we've been very lucky to, to get a lot of um, sort of external speakers to come. Um, and many of them, it was really nice to see um, them appearing today. So we've had Compassion in World Farming. I forgot to add Soil Association, but we have had the Soil Association, World Animal Protection, Sean's been, RSPCA have been. So try and keep uh, it very real for the vet students about, about dealing with animal welfare when they qualify. And, and for the future, educationally, um, you know, we, we want to sort of, you know, keep it fresh. So we've 
got to review and update our courses. Um, we've got to keep in touch with what's going on. So today has just been amazing. Um, a lot of that I was taking notes of and will be appearing in next year's lecture course. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, keep fighting. I'd probably regret putting that in, really. I just kind of meant you've got to stand up. The veterinary curriculum are very packed. There's a lot to get in there. And veterinary knowledge is expanding all the time. So you've got to like stand up for yourself and say, you know, we need this space. We need this time. Great developments in the new veterinary schools. So, um, you know, it'd be nice maybe to collaborate with them um, and other, you know, welfare lecturers and um, perhaps something AWF could perhaps bring us all together. And, and finally, it's really important that we work to continue to strengthen the voice of the veterinary profession in animal welfare. And our role in that is by the sort of underpinning veterinary education, because after all, sort of a passion for animals and animal welfare is genuinely why we generally join this profession. But what's really important, I think, what our role is, is um, we can help make that voice informed and um, reasoned, and as we've talked about so much today, um, evidence-based. So finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to AWF. It's been an absolute privilege um, to create and deliver this essential part of veterinary education. And it's been a lot of fun and an enjoyable and interesting um, area to teach veterinary students. And for this discussion forum, say, brilliant today, really enjoyed it. Um, and also thank them because they have actually also supported my own research as well. So here's to AWF for the next 40 years. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. That was brilliant. Um, we'll go straight in next, please, to Dorothy McKeegan, who, as we've heard, is an animal welfare scientist and senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here and to celebrate 40 years of AWF. I'm going to talk a bit about the role of AWF in animal welfare research. So the first thing to say is that animal welfare research presents unique challenges. We've seen today already that the definition of welfare itself continues to evolve. We're moving away from five freedoms, which is a helpful checklist, but has limitations towards uh, new frameworks like the five domains. An increasing adoption of five domains um, makes it clear that our actual aim is to understand how animals feel and what their subjective experiences are. But that, of course, is a considerable uh, scientific challenge, given that these are essentially unobservable things. We also have the challenge of how we assess the welfare of both individual animals and large groups in various different contexts. And it can be difficult for animal welfare scientists to access funding that's been reserved for more fundamental biological studies because our work is often viewed as being only applied. So I want to just mention the importance of lectureships because the appointments at this level were uh, instrumental in generating the sort of welfare research outcomes that have happened. The traditional academic pro progression for the research route is to get an undergraduate degree, possibly a master's, a PhD, and then do one or possibly more postdoctoral research positions. But it's only at the point of lecturer that you're actually then able to start applying for large grants in your own name. And you can start tackling bigger issues and having some direction um, over your own research trajectory. So lectureships are so important, that's why these appointments really made a difference. This kind of uh, platform enables the building of research momentum and new research groups. And research on this level um, can increase the visibility of animal welfare within the vet schools, which maybe some of which didn't have a strong welfare programme before, and also externally in the wider research community. And of course, as Jennifer has just been saying, we're all involved in teaching animal welfare too, so having active researchers is really important for research-led teaching. So I want to just cover a few research highlights. Um, Don's already mentioned some as well. I've just got a few from my own research group. Um, in what the one way that we can progress is to advance the field, and that's mostly in animal welfare assessment, working out better how to understand these subjective experiences of animals. So, for example, in Glasgow, we've been developing and validating new methods to assess acute and chronic stress in animals using thermal imaging. We've also been working with better ways to capture and analyse remote uh, physiological signals to understand um, animal states. And we've also been doing recent work using accelerometers, for example, to then more readily and, and efficiently capture particular behavioural uh, states, for example, play in dairy calves in, in the picture. 
But of course, the reason we all actually do this work is to improve animal welfare, to have impact in some way. And of course, if anyone here works in a university as an academic, they'll know that impact is what it's all about uh, for all researchers now. And it's defined as the effect research has beyond academia. We don't just want this information to circulate in scientific journals. What's great is that, of course, welfare research readily lends itself to impact. There's a whole range of routes for us to have impact with our work. We can be characterising the issues themselves, working out why they're happening, working out how to solve them, promoting changes in practice on the ground, and, of course, underpinning evidence-based policy and legislation. And the, all the universities are involved in the Research Excellence Framework, or REF exercise, which requires them to, the, the universities to present these impact cases. These are exemplars of impact. And although we've all had lots of impacts between the three of us, I wanted to mention a couple of these that have been put forward as these cases and have been highly ranked. My work on infrared beak chimming and hens was put forward because it directly underpinned UK legislation. And Jennifer's work on contagious ovine digital dermatitis directly changed how that condition is, is tested for and prevented and so on in, in, on the ground. And that's the kind of impact that the, the, the REF cases are looking for. It's sort of in the real world. My work on low atmospheric, low atmospheric pressure standing in brothers also underpinned a change to EU legislation. And recently, AWF funded a Delphi research project, which has led to a prioritised list of welfare issues and managed animals in the UK, which now many organisations are using to help promote and prioritise their approach to solving them. And my current work on lab rodent euthanasia has the potential to transform practice around the world. So we really are making a difference. And this is only just some examples. Just to mention as well that we do the research and we publish and we hopefully have these impacts, but we're also in doing that, supporting research and the animal welfare community more widely. We've all been involved in um, grant panels that, that scrutinise grants and ensure high quality for agencies like BBSRC and DEFRA. We, we've edited journals and reviewed papers and grants in this field. We've both chaired and been members of institutional ethics committees which, of course, are involved in the governance of research with regard to animal welfare. Uh, David and I have both been on FOC, and I'm still on the, the new AUK. Um, I was a founder member of the Animal Welfare Research Network, um, and we've all been providing advice and training to, to, to NGOs and industry. So we're not just researchers and educators. We've got all these other kind of tendrils going out into the wider community. And of course, as educators working in the vet schools, we're hoping to inspire others to get involved in animal welfare research. This is Cameron. I have his permission to use this photo. Um, who did his project with me last summer. He's an undergraduate vet who wanted to look at environmental management of indoor housed uh, poultry because of the flock down orders to do with avian influenza. And he'd never done any sort of research before. So it really gives people the chance just to try this. And of course, AWF also directly support these efforts, as you heard from one of our, our students earlier today, with their student research grant scheme. So we can help uh, animal science and BVMS students, and I'm sure there's other degrees that are in the other vet schools, to experience research for the first time. In Glasgow, we have the MSc in Animal Welfare, Science, Ethics and Law, which again leads to uh, students experiencing research. And there's a couple of papers there from students on that programme, both of which went on to do PhDs, in fact. And we've all done PhD training, training the next generation of welfare scientists and increasing that expertise. And that's an, those stats from Dawn were amazing, from 20 to 4,000. That's, that's what we can do if we have these positions in the universities. We can provide that platform for training. We've also done early career research and mentoring, so beyond PhD level. And yeah, I've just put the word collaboration in because we collaborate with clinicians and other scientists in all sorts of ways. So the legacy has been, has been large. Um, I, as I put this very short talk together, I was struck by the breadth of that legacy and how, how many ways these leaderships have influenced this whole field. I've tried to summarise them here on this slide. We've directly improved animal welfare. We've advanced the way that we can assess and measure welfare. We've, direct, we've got new research groups and PIs that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for these lectureships. We've been able to do research-led teaching and training in the vet schools and beyond. We've inspired, I hope, the next generation, uh, in our, even our undergraduates, to be aware of animal welfare science, even if they don't choose to then go into it. And there's now greater expertise in the UK supporting stakeholders and policymakers in this area. So I'd like also to add my huge thanks to AWF for making my position at Glasgow possible. Um, over the last however many years it's been. I've done this picture of ripples. It's like dropping three pebbles in a pond. 
and the ripples continue to grow and intersect. Thank you. Another brilliant talk, thanks so much Dorothy. And then straight in uh, to our last presentation, which is from David Main, who's Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor of Production Animal Health and Welfare at the Royal Agricultural University. Thank you very much, Sean. It's a delight here to do this final session talking about uh, how AWF has impacted on policy and it's had a major impact. So uh, I, I'm very glad to, to do that, not just because AWF kick-started my academic career, which it did, so thank you also for that. So what I want to couple, touch on a few things what AWF has, has done. So first of all, we've heard earlier about how AWF has supported science, and that has been a really important foundation for major legislative uh, change. Uh, the other type of science that it's funded is more the social science, the human behaviour change, and that is a very important, uh, crucial issue we've heard today. AWF supported, for example, the motivational interviewing uh, uh, work, the first application in the veterinary profession. And I have to shout out to Ellie, because I thought Ellie's uh, talk this morning was a really good example of how, real, how practical social science can be, real pr practical outputs. It's a really good example. Um, the, the other element... This, well, it's not stop working. Yeah, good. <laughs> We've heard about the education, and, and I think it's really quite difficult to underestimate how fundamental that education change has been. I took this quote, I happen to have on my bookshelf, a uh, 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 book, 1963 Pig Housing by David Sainsbury. There may be some people in the room that are aware of this book, very important book. I had took this quote from it. In designing a piggery or a conversion, the needs of a pig must come first. And you could write that today, and it's still relevant today. But of course, if you look at the textbook, there is no mention at all anywhere in behavioural needs around maternal behaviour, exploratory behaviour, social behaviour, not included in it at all. So that's the transformative difference that we've now got completely embedded. Everybody understands that behavioural needs matter. So education has had a very major important difference. And the other, the last element I think has had a major influence is this forum. I do believe that this has had a major impact on policy uh, we heard today human behaviour change is a very important thing. Last year we talked about the gene editing. That has, has concrete impact on BVA working groups, etc. Very real influences. So a little, little second or two to think about discussion forums. Uh, and the key thing I think here, how it has helped, is it gives academic and professional credibility to this discipline, to this uh, endeavour, to this discussion. I think it has had a very important impact on moving animal welfare from radical. When I first started this, Donald's got his stories, I had my stories, I was told a left-wing loony, uh, sandal-wearing um, sandal uh, extremist. And I think, really? Is that... Definitely not me now, obviously. But the point is, the, 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 the provocative, some of the uh, cutting-edge stuff we were hearing today is really important because that is where the debate progresses and you move those radical ideas to the, to the mainstream. So I think this has been important in normalising welfare discussions. I think the formats which have evolved over time are really important and, that, and that's good to see that, that growing. But actually, I think one of the key things, this, why this forum works, is the multi-species thing that actually really is. One, you're talking about mice, then your cats, then your horses, then your pigs, and it's all in a big mash, and I think it really helps the, the discussion. So this is a word cloud of uh, discussion forum topics, and I deliberately, actually, there was quite a few farms uh, in there, but I deliberately balanced the cat and the dog because I see a good balance in the conversations around those, those species, and I think that's a very important lesson for us all. Um, so... What? So, there we go. So, so what impact has this uh, the AWF and the discussion forums had on the on the preventing professions? I will give some examples of that. I do think we need to shout out for the BVA and the welfare strategy, which I know Sean has had a major a major part in producing, and many others in this room too. That was a really important moment. That really crystallised what BVA was uh, was about, and it had some radical ideas at the time that are in there, embedded in there. Uh, for example, about a good life framework, uh, talking about identifying specific welfare problems. Uh, and funnily enough, we've had this influence doesn't just extend to the UK. Uh, the FBE has picked this up in 2021. I think Sean probably also has something to do with that too. He was, he was involved in both. But, but that, the point is these animal welfare ideas 
have been translatable and are having a, a, a significant international uh, influence, which is really great to see. So, for example, the last one there, promote the concept of an animal welfare-focused veterinary profession. Really, really fundamental, valuable stuff that has been picked up uh, by the FVE. Really good to see. So those, those documents listed out some of the animal welfare priorities, and in pigs, uh, I just randomly chose pigs, there's been some, a few conversations about pigs today. Uh, those topics have been highlighted, the tail biting, farrowing crates, and as been mentioned before, the, BV, the AWF funded the Delphi uh, project, which going full loop back to that textbook I was talking, which talked about the needs, the most important severity and duration priority welfare issue for pigs was behavioural needs not met, and the third most prevalent uh, was behavioural needs not met. So here we've come full circle for uh, behavioural needs being highlighted amongst the profession. That, that is the change that's been brought about, a really important change. So it's had a change on the veterinary profession, but I would also argue it's had a change on the industry. I've couched this in terms of now we have, I say, an industry that has a certain amount of confidence in animal welfare. We could have a debate about whether that confidence is justified, but we moved from a position where the industry was dismissive, because it didn't have the, about the science, as, as Don said, defensive, to now have a position where actually UK, animal, UK industry groups are trying to be proactive and trying to do good stuff. I, I see them trying. So, for example, the, the, the animal welfare claim in this advert, which incidentally had, they had to withdraw from the, because it wasn't an accurate claim, to me the point is it highlights what the industry wanted. It aims that we want to produce high welfare pork. And I think that's a really important phenomenon. So, so many sectors have got strategies are being proactive. So I think this confidence is a really important change. And it, I think the vet, it would, would that have happened without veterinary input, without veterinary confidence? I don't think so. So I think this forum has had a real uh, place to play in that. Uh, also, we've had, I would say, increasing government confidence in, in animal welfare. Is Jonathan still here? So I think that, oh yeah, he is here. So a very confident um, uh, action plan produced. The animal health and welfare pathway, I've, I've highlighted pigs. We have farrowing crates to reduce sow confinement during farrowing and reduce stresses to keep tails intact. That's government policy. That is a very, very significant deal to have that now highlighted as a government priority. So that's, we, they are significant steps, not small steps. These are very significant steps, which I think this forum has had a role in. I put some question mark here because I think there's still an un, 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 unanswered question about our confidence as world leaders. Politicians love to make claims about animal welfare. We have among the highest environmental and animal welfare standards of any nation on earth. We will succeed in the global marketplace because we are competing at the top of the value chain, not trying to win a race to the bottom. Great, great rhetoric. We love it. But are we really? Are we, are we keeping ahead of the curve? Not necessarily. So I think trade, uh, uh, how we play our leadership role, I think there's some further work uh, we, we can do. We need to keep an, a, an eye on that. So, in conclusion, I would say very clearly there are things to celebrate, without a doubt, but there is some unfinished business, for sure. Change, change can and does happen, and the AWF, I would argue, has clearly made an, an impact on that. But is it enough? What, what bits are left? I expect we could have uh, plenty of sessions about what, what is left here. I've picked out a few that I, I would like to highlight. So, are animals really getting a good life? A lot, no. Absolutely not. Uh, and so that's a work in progress. Are animals part of the problem or solution for the health of the planet? We had that session this afternoon. Mm. Quite a lot of the problem. Who'd have thought that a veterinary conference would have eat less meat as one of the most common uh, responses? Isn't, doesn't the world change? Extraordinary. Uh, and then lastly, does the UK want to be an or even the international leader in animal welfare? So more work to be done. Thank you very much. So some <clears throat> superb um, provocations and questions there to go into the, um, the discussion part of the session. Um, before we do, I think we should just bank what has happened there. As I say, it was with all five of them, not all four. I mean, if we think about how our species relates to the other sentient animals on the planet, these are clearly five of the 
of those who have led that conversation and encouraged others to pick up the conversation. And it's been international, and we really should um, recognize and appreciate that, and of course, say WF's underpinning role. Um, so, two questions. Shall I go to Slido first, and then if anybody wants to put their hand up um, to take a roving mic? But the top one I have here is a question for Don. Um, do you think the veterinary profession now understands that health is an important part of welfare, part of welfare, but not all of it? Uh, I think that it's more moved in, the, in that direction. Uh, so, and, and I, it, people in this room would be, would, might not be completely typical, but uh, so I think there is still, okay, I think the language is still not right. We need to catch up with the language. So health is a part of welfare. Health is an extremely important part of welfare, is something which I have had to say very many times to audiences who didn't really think that health was a major part of welfare. I think in, a veterinary, in the veterinary world, generally we all think that, but there are still plenty of people who, who, who wouldn't say that. Uh, and so I think emphasising that health is a very important part of welfare is important for working on health. And, but, I, but we still have the situation where lots of people say health and welfare. Well, so if health is a part of welfare, then it's, then it's welfare including health. But in the long run, the key thing is to, to emphasise what are the important components of welfare? And health is one of the really important components. And I think the world at large does think that. Yeah, thank you. John. Any of the other panellists want to come on that? No. Uh, well, very much related then. Um, this person asks, could we look at getting animal behaviour in the curriculum for vet schools? Currently, across all vet schools, the information for students is minimal slash optional. We have some welfare coverage, sorry, animal behaviour coverage. Um, I think, as you alluded to, Jennifer, it's just about space in the curriculum at a certain point, and so I suppose we tend to perhaps prioritise other more um, directly relevant things for practice rather than the sort of theory of animal behaviour. I do a little bit on that. I don't know if, if you do, but we do have it in the curriculum, but it's not emphasised, admittedly, just for space. But I agree it's important. Well, it, it, in, in the European Union, it legally has to be. Uh, so you're not allowed to call it a veterinary course unless there is uh, animal behaviour included. Um, however, I think a lot of animal behaviour gets taught in species courses. So sometimes there, it, isn't, it is a, a shortish animal behaviour course, but people are now talking much more about behaviour than they used to in other courses. So uh, and my view is that you need a special course on behaviour, as the same way you need a special course on welfare, but you also need to incorporate it in, in the species courses. And, uh, and I mean, actually, as far as companion animals are concerned, a very large proportion of, it's still the case that a lot of the people who go to a veterinary surgery go there because of a behaviour yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. And so you, everybody it does need to be able to do that. Yeah, and, and I, would, so I would say, I think there was a reasonable amount of behaviour teaching in, in the course. Um, when I first started the role, I was actually put in with the animal behaviour lot, and which worked really well, actually. I, I, I learned a lot from them, and we, we set the exams together and things. So, um, yeah, it's kind of curriculum's changed now, so we're not all in the same place, but the teaching still happens. Um, and, and as you were saying, you know, we particularly... I think, yeah, you know, the students seem to come across very aware of, of animal behaviour, animal demeanour, positive behaviours, negative behaviours. Um, but as Dorothy said, there's, there's a lot of, in the curriculum and also very much, you know, we, we have quite a lot on, um, you know, behavioural issues in, in small animals in particular because that's a big part of clinical work. So I think it's often with the vet course, you know, we, we just, you know, we, we cover so much that there isn't necessarily a badge, this is the animal behaviour course, it'll, it'll come up in different places and I think when, you, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of happens. <laughs> I think David wanted to come Well, up. I just want to come in. So you notice I've moved institutions. I'm now in an agricultural university rather than a veterinary thing. But I, but I do want to make the point about embedding uh, animal welfare and behaviour in other animal-related programmes. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, patchy, to say the least. Really interesting, <laughs> is it? Mm. Thank you, David. Um, and maybe actually just before we move on from the um, veterinary education point, uh, just thinking Nancy De Bruyne and colleagues... 
um, published an assessment of teaching in animal welfare, science, ethics and law across European veterinary institutions, including the UK, which was published just uh, a couple of years ago in Animals, so there's a nice um, embodiment there of, of the direction of travel from based on a, a European-wide survey. Uh, okay, there was a hand, please, yes. There, with the mic. Hi, thank you very much for that presentation and thank you for lifetimes of dedicated work to the care of animals. I don't quite know how to express what I want to say. Um, I think it was said earlier that we're emotional beings and I guess personally I'm feeling quite emotional right now um, because before the break we just heard from Alice Bruff give an absolute like, what is happening to animals is beyond comprehension. Absolutely beyond comprehension. And to be here today celebrating animal welfare, like, I, I, just, I just can't comprehend how we can be doing that. Like, I went to chicken farms a few years ago. It's RSPCA assured, red tractor approved, organic, free-range farms over and over and over again, different farms. And I would find corpses rotting on the floor. My eyes would burn from the ammonia in the air, from the shit and the piss that was everywhere. These animals are, it, it's horrific. And as a veterinary prof profession, as human beings who care, who love animals, we are letting them down so, so, so much. I'm sorry, I'm shaking right now. Um, but I think, I think it's important to hear this, this perspective, because I think this is, so many people feel this. And you know, I'm a young person, I'm 31 years old, and I believed in the welfare myth. I believed it, but it's, it's just not true. So I, I will wrap up. And, no, and, no. Yeah, so I guess what I'd say is, from my perspective, welfare has been a fundamental failure. And the reason why is because it's trying to redeem the irredeemable. Animals aren't property, they're beings that deserve peace and freedom. So what I'd ask is what will be the position for the next 40 years? Will we step up to face the actual reality of what animals are facing and stop patting ourselves on the back when there's so much suffering? Thank you very much. And I think I would, before I go to the panel, I would share David's reflection that to have this sort of challenge within this event is really, really important, and not least because there is a generation of young people coming through put, voicing these concerns and these challenges, and you've just done it very, uh, in a very articulate way, so thank you for your contribution. Um, I guess it very much leads into our thoughts about the next 40 years, so who wants to come in first? Don, please. Uh, I, I think that we need a major change in attitude, and I think that, that's your central point, really. Because, uh, and, and I tried to say a little bit about it, in that I, I think that the, the humans are not the centre of the world. Humans are only part of the world. Uh, humans are not the only important beings in the world. Uh, there are lots of sentient beings. There are lots of other, other beings, other organisms, and there is far too much focus on humans. So I see that as a general world problem, and what you're articulating is a part of it, but I also see that there's been a substantial change in the last 40 years, and, and, and the change is that a lot of farmed animals, a lot of pet animals, a lot of laboratory animals are now much better off than they were, and that's partly because of increased knowledge about how they function, and it's partly about legislation, and it's especially about the public demanding change. And, uh, and that's, that's not just in the, it's certainly not just in the UK. Lots of other countries are saying the same thing. I mentioned very briefly that in a survey of people in Brazil, when lots and lots of people were asked what's important about sustainability, what they said was the welfare of animals is the most important thing about sustainability. They didn't say carbon footprint, they said the welfare of animals. And that is a wide-ranging view, and so there are now more people thinking about it, but there are also people who never think about it. And some of the people who never think about it are able to be in charge of animals, and some of them are treating animals very badly, but other people who are 
um, in charge of animals, treat them really well. Now, it varies from species to species. It's pretty hard for broiler farmers to treat them well because they can't run their business in, and compete. So we actually need legislative change. We need changes driven by the consumers saying, I won't buy it. And so that's happening, and it's going to happen more. But, so I think we need major change, but there has been really important advances, not fast enough for you, and actually not fast enough for me either, but I do think things are, have been moving in a good direction. Thanks, John. And to the other three, yeah, so commenting on the, on the pace, the urgency, and the animal rights agenda and how it intersects with animal welfare. Yeah, again, I really appreciate your comment, and I fully respect your position, and I think there's much we, were, we should not celebrate. But like Don says, we are celebrating progress, and I think that's worthy of, of note, given where we've come from. And even in my career as a welfare scientist, there's been a radical change in terms of the validity of the topic, funding, and uptake by the industry. And I appreciate that's not... Um, potentially you see that's propping up a system that you don't agree with and I fully respect that view but that is a particular ethical position and others would have an ethical position that would say we can use animals if we give them good lives and good deaths and use them in certain ways I appreciate that's not your view so I think we have to be aware of that as well that one position ultimately isn't maybe isn't the goal but I think we do have to recognize that there is a societal shift that's very great and visible and to me it's going in absolutely the right direction um, and I think with the, that, that societal shift gaining momentum, I think we will see an increased pace of change over the next period compared to the last 40 years. Thanks, Dorothy. David? The, the, the differences or different paces of change is inevitably very frustrating for people at either end of that spectrum. So I, I think the, the input is, is fantastic. But I, I, I do want to emphasize that also the a Bernie Rowland quote about uh, the judo, not sumo approach. And that is, when people are starting to make the shift, help them use their own energy to focus on animal welfare to bring you alongside on that journey too. We've got to work at all of these different levels. So yes, be productive, pro provocative, but also we've got to bring people with us in this change. Thank you. I think we've just got time for one more quick short one and there's a hand up just uh, there. And then we'll go to Julian. Yes, please, sorry. That, uh, uh, We'll do two, because it's going to be the one behind. So two very short ones, please. Yeah, um, yeah I did actually put a question on Slido. Um, I asked a question. You've been talking a lot about um, vets and vet schools. Uh, I'm very much involved in veterinary nursing education. I'd like to know when AWF and the BVA are going to start inviting vet nurses onto this platform as well. Thank you. Okay, but so I'm really glad we got that one because that's really important. We, I, I, we categorically have had vet nurses presenting uh, yeah. on this platform at this event because one Can of my colleagues at PDSA. We've, we've also but, trained vet nurses. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you have, but I, mm. we, I do a training course for vet nurses on vet and welfare and ethics, so we have extended that education. We do have representation on the board with vet nurses, but yes, I think the BVA and the AWF very much take that vet nurses is an important part, and we also have welfare professionals who are not vets or vet nurses uh, on our board because that's, we have to look at the round of animal welfare. Yeah, but clearly your perception is that that visibility yeah. can be improved and that's really important to note as well, so thank you. And then, yeah, just one the lady behind, please, and that'll be the last one. This is just a final kind of optimistic comment from a vet student. Um, I very much share the same views as our colleague there from um, Animal Rising. Um, but I'm, I very much recognise the support that I receive that students, even five years ago, wouldn't have received. You know, thanks to the support of um, welfare scientists teaching on my course, like um, Dorothy alluded to, um, I, when I went on my allowing placement, I was able to um, decline to do um, the castrations of lambs. And to be honest, I probably would have done that had I not known that there was an option not to. And to me, I think that is a great success and it gives me a lot of optimism for the next generation of vets and continuing the work of the AWF. Thank you so much. That's really, really important perspective to hear as well. So, is there any tiny note of response on conscientious objection and Pleased empowerment to hear of that. vet students? <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, all power to your elbow. Uh, okay, so I must hand over to Julian. We're out of... Um, Time has been a, a brilliant session, thank you. Um, by way of closing comment, I was going to kind of pick up on what David said, actually. The chain of being that we've seen today of um, 
uh, Ellie Miller, given her fabulous student presentation in the presence of the Chair of the Animal Health Welfare Board for England and her ability to feed and Tim and his recognition of Don Broom's teaching and the influence that he has had on you. And I think that's happening in, in multiple ways across the whole audience. So well done to everybody and uh, very many thanks indeed to AWF and to our speakers, David Main, Dorothy McKeegan, Jennifer Duncan and Don Broom. Thank you.